This will be our 40th lesson in the Epistle to the Ephesians, and we'll, be, we'll commence with chapter 4 tonight. Now, Paul's laid the groundwork for what he's going to say. The first three chapters are like foundation, foundation work. If you wanted to view them from a summary viewpoint, the first chapter, he tells you what God has intended in salvation and how he's gone about doing it and the provisions he's made. Chapter 2 he tells you what he's done to the people of God and what they participated in. In chapter 3, he tells you why he did it. And now he's going to call the saints to an aggressive stance. I mean, this is not child's play. I'm deeply offended when somebody says the things of God are on a childlike level. I'm deeply offended by this because, first of all, it reveals the person's level of intelligence is very low. And secondly, it reveals they don't have any idea what God's doing. Amen. You think they do, you hand this fourth chapter to a child and tell them to explain it to you. Or the first or the second or the third. So he's calling us to an aggressive stance, and it required that you got to know a lot of stuff. You have to have a handle on it. You have to grasp it. You have to have some understanding, or you won't be able to do these things, which have to be done. That's as if you want to be saved, they have to be done. Now, it will require the separation of the people from mediocrity like average and mediocre and run-of-the-mill, this, this has got to go. There's no place for this in the kingdom of God. God is unique. Jesus is unique. The Spirit is unique. Salvation is unique. The gospel's unique. The people are too. All of these things can't produce a mediocre, haphazard type people. So wherever you see people that profess to be Christians, that are these kind of people... They aren't Christians. Either that or this, we're, we're not reading the truth here. This is not what God produces through Christ. This is not what the death of Christ produces. This is not what union with Christ produces. This is not what believing the gospel produces. <coughs> so I'm really not interested in what produces it. I just want to get away from it. <coughs> So this will not allow for dullness of hearing. If, a per, if it's hard, dullness of hearing means it can't, it doesn't get in. Uh -huh. it's, like, uh -huh. it's like bounces off. It doesn't get in. There's no place for this here. He's not saying like, come on, folk, do the best you can. A lot of preachers like this. Oh, yeah. Do the best you can. Yeah. We're not all perfect. This is not that type of thing. This is not a... Abonition, let's try harder now. Let's try a little harder. This isn't what this is about. This stuff we're talking about has got to be done. It's not something you attempt. It's not a goal set out there. You've got to plod your way toward it. That's not what it is. You've got to think of it as got to be done like, like by tomorrow it's got to be done. That's how you have to think. Because you don't know whether you're even going to have it tomorrow. Amen. So the premise behind these uh, exhortations, and there's going to be a number of them from this point on that we're going to deal with, is that the grace of God and the gifts of God are intended to produce results. Amen. And where results aren't produced, the grace has not been received. And the gospel has not been believed. That's why he's so earnest about this, what he's saying. That's why he said what he did the first three chapters. God's done something. Christ has done something. He's made something out of you. He's given something to you. He's provided everything you need. Now, you can't offer an excuse for not coming up higher. Amen. <laughs> The means through which these resources that he supplied works, it comes to you by grace, 
and it's accessed by faith. So those, so if, so if your face weak, the whole thing, the whole thing goes down. <coughs> and he's told you now this is to manifest the multifaceted wisdom of God, the principalities and powers in heavenly places. So if if they're not impressed by what's going on here, what's going on here isn't real. Otherwise, that's not what... See, God's doing this to impress it with his wisdom. The, the principalities and powers, these are way higher people, personalities than we are, with his manifold wisdom. So, so Paul's going to go to work to ensure this happens. Make it happen. Paul knows if this does not take place, what he's going to call us to do, then God's been dishonored and that principalities and powers haven't been shown the wisdom of God, and for all practical purposes, Jesus wasted his time. He knows that that's the way it is. Now, I know that uh, a lot of what parades itself as Christianity doesn't even take into account what heaven thinks about what's going on. But this whole thing is about what heaven thinks, not what about what about men thinks. That's important, but it's like down down the ladder. It's not at the top. All right, here's our text. Verse verse one. Well, actually, I'm just going to deal with verse one. I'm sorry. Therefore, I therefore. The prisoner of the Lord beseech you that ye walk worthy of the Lord, worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. Yes, I see that I, uh, I tar targeted covering the first two verses, and I see now that I, I couldn't able to do it. <laughs> I forgot about that. I'm sorry. <laughs> Yes, I caught up what I was doing. I forgot where I was going. <laughs> now, these are important words. I, therefore. <laughs> Some other versions say, so, or in light of all this. Now, this is an expression of spiritual logic. Now, you... I, I know this isn't true of you, but some people have never thought that what God says is logical. But it's a separate, it's a different kind of logic. It's not human logic. Valid thinking leads to valid conclusions. So everything God has done is designed to produce this conclusion over here because nobody in all the world is going to live for God if they haven't concluded that's a thing to do. So if people are fundamentally ungodly, you know, they're not really living for God. They really don't think they have to. That's why they're not. Well, they have, this may not be what they tell you, but see, I know what the reason is. So I'll just tell you why it is. So Paul's going to exhibit here some spiritual logic or thought. <laughs> it's been founded upon truth. Some people's religious thought religious thinking processes are founded upon human analysis or human tradition or some church position, not on the truth. <coughs> Even during the early days of the church, very few people grasped what was really happening in salvation. Even, book, even the book of Acts, it, it, it hadn't gelled yet. So Paul administered to them. Peter knew that Paul had something here. He said, and, his, and he's an old man when he said this. He, Peter was near the close of his life when he wrote these words in Second Peter. He said of some things, he tried to Paul's writings, in which are some things hard to be understood. Now, he didn't mean it were hard for him to understand. Yes, yeah. <laughs> that's not what he meant. I've heard people say that, uh, oh, my goodness, this man is full of the Holy Spirit. Hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest. That means they take the 
twists, rest means twists. means they take these texts of scripture, they twist them around so they finally can fit into their theological mold. See, their theological mold is this big, and you got a body of truth this big, so instead of saying, whoa, I got to get a new mold, you know, <laughs> they try and twist it and work it around so it fits in that little, that little hole. Which they rest to their own destruction, as the people that did it will be destroyed. You can't destroy the, the scriptures. <laughs> you can't destroy the word of God. But whoever tampers with it, God's going on record now. This is going to happen. Whoever tampers with this and tries to twist it, God's going to destroy him. Now, as long as you're alive, you've got a chance to get out of that category. But praise the Lord, I finally, I finally got, I got out of it. I'm, I'm thankful trying to urge other people to get out of it. Now, it's not just ex what Paul said, like the words he used. Maybe he used big words or something like that. Intellectual challenging words. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about the, his line of reasoning. How Paul thought. The conclusions he read. That's, that's the thing he's talking about that was beyond their grasp. And that's what we're, we're witnessing here. We're witnessing a spiritual logic that leads right to certain intended conclusions. If you can think right, you'll live right. Amen. If you think wrong, no matter how hard you try, you'll live wrong. That's the way it is. Now in the heavenly economy, I'm going to show you how this logic works. In the heavenly economy, if you've got the heavenly mindset, justification makes perfect sense. Justification by faith. If you're, if you're thinking like God thinks, you're thinking like heaven thinks, you're in sync with Christ, predestination is thoroughly reasonable. Yes, if you got this mindset, the grace of God is defined and declared in scriptures, it makes, makes sense. You, gotta, it doesn't, you don't stumble at it. You don't say, oh, well, but if you have grace, maybe the people get a little too loose in their living and, but you think right about it. No one who understands what the Spirit is saying to the churches that this has this heavenly mindset fails to see that you've got to fight the good fight of faith. What you get from God, you have to fight to keep it. You don't fight me. You don't fight your brethren. <laughs> you fight the devil. And you fight against everything trying to take it from you. See, it makes good. Once you have this heavenly logic, this makes sense to do this. See, it makes perfect sense. Because God puts you in the devil's territory, it, it puts you in time. The devil's the preeminent person here, and you've got to work it out here so it makes sense. Well, I've got to fight. Satan's not going to just say, well, there you go, I lost another one. Yes, now he'll try, he'll try and get, get you back. Running the race with patience. Patience here meaning endurance. Keep it, even if you're tired, you keep running. Maybe the pace slowed down a little bit. You keep running. You'll get your spiritual second wind if you just keep on. I've seen people give up. And they're like a runner didn't get his second wind. He might have been like a few paces away. Just maybe ten more paces. He got that rejuvenation and took off. But he, but he quit too soon. See, when you're thinking like God intends people to think, it makes perfect sense. Keep running, stay in the race. Don't drop out. Don't be discouraged. Yes, you're tired. Yes, you're weary. Yes, it's even hard to breathe. There's nobody that seems to have anything to strengthen you. Keep going. Yeah. Makes See how at that point in time, that now exhortation becomes premium. That's right. Because if somebody comes to you right at that moment when you're getting ready to quit, and they say, hey, Hey, wait a minute. I've been here before. Yeah. You just go a little bit longer. Yeah. That's right. So you'll be able There's to a water station it. just up the road. Hey, man. That's right. Well, you'll find it to be so. Yeah. Yeah. You'll find out. You'll be like a runner. You turn to bend. Whoa, there's somebody passing out the water out there. That's the way it is in the spirit. It's the same way. If you continue your race, God will have, see to it that someone pops up. Amen. All of a sudden, it has exactly what you need. Okay. But you need to keep running. Because he provides it, we're not 
put upon more than we're able to bear. Amen. Right. Yeah. <laughs> God's no. managing these things. That's, That's right. Now, see, my point is that, that this is the way you think yeah. uh -huh. when you're in the flow of, yeah. of the spiritual mindset. Where this posture is absent, with, with it doesn't make sense. They're not running because it doesn't make sense to run. They're not fighting because it makes sense to fight. They're not keeping the faith because it make. Well, where this is happening, the understanding of the things of God is missing. They really can't think right. Now you may you may come up with a lot of explanations for it. Well, they're weak. Well, they were around the wrong people. Well, you know, but let's just go right straight to the bottom line and not try and figure out all it. Go straight to the bottom line. They're they're not thinking right. So that's the project we got to get them thinking right. That's what Paul's doing in this text. <laughs> that's why he prayed like he did for the Ephesians. He first he preached, then he prayed, then he taught. First he announced to them what the thing is all about, where God's going, what he's done. Then he, then he prays, then he opens it up to them. What's really happened? <coughs> he says in the beginning of his letter, Paul stressed the person of God. And what he's done through Christ. He's blessed us with all spiritual blessings. He's chosen us. He's predestinated us. He's made us accepted. In Christ we have redemption. He has abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. He's made known unto us the mystery of his will. We've obtained an inheritance. He's ordained that we should be to the praise of his glory. We've been sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Now based on the foregoing statements based on that God's quickened us or made us alive he has raised us up together with Christ made us sit together with him in heavenly places he's made us nigh he's brought us to where we need to be to, to get all these things and he's joined us with the Jews so we're not alone that's the believing Jews. You understand what we're talking about. To whom the promises were given, and he's made provision for all men to see. Paul said, I'm going to make all men see. So God's made provision to make all men see and to open up their eyes. God's made provision for all men to comprehend and discern what's, what's going on. All in order that God might receive, quote, glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages. So this is a, has no end. God had received glory through the church infinitum. At, all through, there's no end. There's no language. See, there is no English word or any other word in any language that means eternal. It's a different, not even a human concept. So they talk age upon age and generation upon generation. They use words like that to explain eternal because they're, that isn't like a human term. But that's what God's designed. Amen. This work is so big, I mean, it's not going to like rehearse it over and over and over and go over the same things over and over and over. That's not how God gets glory. God doesn't get glory by repeating the same, Hail Mary, Mother of God. This is not how God gets glory. Thing keeps unfolding. Yes, it keeps unfolding. Keeps getting bigger. Keeps getting larger. That's how. <coughs> now, now he's told us all this has happened. So, is anything expected from us after we've received all of these things? You know, and he's told you that the things that all people in Christ. This is all people in Christ. He hasn't just identified a particular layer of people. This is everybody that's in Christ. Does God expect any results from this? Are they calculated to produce any results? Did God make this tremendous investment in salvation of himself and his son and his spirit and his angels? Did he make this tremendous investment just to get us out of a bad situation? 
Well, you might be not be surprised that some people think he did. Just to get you out of a bad situation. No, it's get out to get you in a good situation. He brought you out so he could bring you in. He took Israel out of Egypt so they could get into Canaan. See? <coughs> now, if all that Paul has taught us is, is true to this point, <coughs> then it's totally unreasonable and illogical to have a spiritually dead church. We don't want anyone to try and explain this to us. It's just unreasonable. I mean, you might have a child say to you, they think, they think the color black is really red. And so they say, this is really red. Now, you might try and uh, explain, <laughs> say, well, under certain conditions, it may look red. And if I hey, maybe your vision is not good, it may look red. You may try and explain that situation, but it's a waste of time. The thing is black, it's not red. And you got to work on teaching them that it's black, not red. Amen. That's the way it is with things of God. There's a lot of things taught in the name of Christ that are like calling black red. It's like changing the price tags on things. It's like when I was a boy, they had the five, five and ten cent store. Everything in it was five or ten cents. And you could get 50 cents, you could get a lot of stuff. But there's price tag, the lower, lowest price tag would be 10 for a penny. So it'd be price tag 10 for a penny. 5 for a penny, 3 for a penny, penny, 2 for a nickel, nickel 10. Now somebody come in and cha change those price tags and took the dime price tag and stuck it on the 5 for a penny. That's what the devil's done. That's right. <laughs> He's made people think they're getting a lot. When what doesn't cost a lot can't be a lot. That's how it is in the kingdom of God. We've been purchased with the precious blood of Christ. And the, sell, the purchase thing purchased is as precious as the cost, that thing, that, what it costs to get it. And that's, that's what Paul is telling you. He's telling you the precious things that have been invested in, and they can't produce an inactive church. Stumbling Christians... They don't understand. They always had to be instructed and always had to be rebuked and always had to be recovered. These do not bring glory to God. Now, it's not our business to condemn them. I understand that. But it is our business to save them. That is our business. And we know that this, this is not what God produces. This is not what Christ and salvation produces. This is not what it produces. Well, of course, first of all, you've got to make up your mind that that's... Uh -huh. A lot of people aren't there yet. Did you know a lot of people aren't there yet? They think you can have a partial gospel and people can be saved by it. Yeah. I'm going to tell you they can't. Yeah, that's right. You can't be saved by a gospel God didn't inspire. Yeah, but given nobody would be content <laughs> to let someone that only took the first year's course in heart surgery... Let them open them up. Say, well, I know how to open him up really good. I've learned that. I got my manual right Yeah, here. but I, but after that, I'm on my own. Now, see, but see, in the religion world, they allow people to do this. I know, I know it. I know it. Now, now let's be clear before we, before we go further here. That this is not a suggestion to be the best Christian you can. Everybody do the best you can now. If that's the best you can do, God will accept if it's the best you can do. Well, you wouldn't send Mephibosheth out to war, would you? You remember he was lame in his feet? Would you send him out to war? You'd, if, it was, if, we, if he was called to war, you'd know that we, God, we've got to take care of this foot problem Mephibosheth has. Before we send him out to battle, we've got to take care of this foot problem. Because what God requires can't be done by weak faith, weak stumbling believers. It, it, can't be, it can't be done. On purpose, it can't be done. <coughs> 
The Corinthians, you remember, they embraced another gospel. Galatians did the same thing. They left him that called them into the grace of Christ. See, to embrace another gospel, you have to leave the Lord. <laughs> yeah. Now, this has some startling ramifications, but this is the truth, notwithstanding. You, this is Galatians 1 6. You left him who calls you into the grace of Christ to another gospel, which is not another. <coughs> now, what Paul's going to teach now is a vivid description of what the scriptures call the work of faith with power. That's 2 Thessalonians 1.1. 1, 1. The work of faith with power. Therefore, what I'm going to say now is the next logical thing to say. First of all, I'd like to remind you who I am. The prisoner of the Lord. I mean, this thing has cost me something already. I'm going to show it to you that no matter what happens to you, you've got to hold on. So I'm going to speak to you as the prisoner of the Lord. This is the third section. This, Bob, Paul began this third section of this letter by saying, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ to you Gentiles. In writing Philemon, he referred to himself as Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ. To the Corinthians, he wrote he was in prisons more oft. Because I went to jail a lot of times. In fact, he was in prison when he wrote this letter. He's in prison. But he wants the Ephesians to know why he was in prison. It wasn't because he committed some crime or if fomented a rebellion against the Roman government or refused to pay his taxes or some other illegal thing. That isn't why. That isn't why. He is in prison because of the way he thought which dictated the way he preached. He, had a, he knew what was going to happen, but he preached it anyway. You know, he's... He's among those that are said to be first in the church, the apostles. So he's, he, he lays himself as I hear here's what it is. What I was called to do caused me to put in to be put in conflict. Mm -hmm. At which time I had a choice, so to speak. I could leave off the preaching and say, maybe this isn't the time. I mean, maybe this isn't the time to do it. I'm not being received, so maybe I should wait a while. I had that option, but I, I didn't take it because I knew the investment God made in me. How dare I think like that when God has invested his grace in me? Yes. Um, godly men and women act. Uh, I'm reminded as you're speaking of Daniel who he, he did what he was supposed to do. He didn't break the rules. He was under... Uh, administration it was not a godly administration by any stretch of imagination and he did what was right but when it came to the Lord they told him not to pray, pray he opened his windows and prayed that's right you can see how this applies now to what what he's talking about because he knows that as soon as as soon as believers whether they're living in Joplin or Jerusalem get serious some opposition is going to come in Satan will see to it now. Satan will see to it this happens, and God will see to it that he allows him to do it. Because for, from your viewpoint, it's a test. It's a test. And he won't allow you, as Sister Barbara already said, to be tempted or tested above what you're able. So the test won't exceed your ability to say no. Amen. <laughs> the, fact, the fact that Paul's imprisoned confirmed he was actually an alien in the world. He was actually a stranger and a foreigner here, or they wouldn't have put him in prison. In fact, some of them, because they found he's a Roman citizen, were balked at the, balked at the idea, even that. <laughs> His citizenship was not primarily in the world, so he knew, but he knew this. And so he didn't balk at this uh, at all. Filling up his major. Filling up his major. That's right. Amen. 
See, there were a group of people that were res largely responsible for it, putting him in prison. They were religious people that couldn't think like Paul thought. Mm -hmm. yeah. They didn't have the spiritual logic. They couldn't make the transition from Moses to Christ. They, yeah. they couldn't read the prophets and make the transition to Christ. Mm -hmm. They couldn't hear what Christ said and make the transition to be not of the world. They, mm -hmm. they lacked this thinking, so they opposed Paul and had him put in prison. Now Paul's going to share with the Ephesians what actually sustained him. He told them about this already. He said, He has given us all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. The first chapter, verse 3, told that ahead of time. That's what enabled Paul to survive. And he told the Ephesians this because that's going to enable them to survive as well. So he's not calling the Ephesians to a happier life as ordinarily perceived. He's not calling them to worldly advantages, riches and acclaim and worldly success, so forth. So he points to them, I'm, he didn't say to I, Paul, the premier apostles, he did, even though he was. <laughs> he didn't say that. Yeah. He said, I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ. He didn't mean Jesus Christ had shackles on him. <laughs> That's not what he meant. From the Christ viewpoint, he was the Lord's free man, from Christ's point of view. But what he was saying was, is what Christ gave him to do that put him in prison. Now, I'll tell you how you'll be brought to think like this pretty soon, if you haven't already. I'll just give my personal, the personal about me. I never really had any any kind of sickness or anything like that most of my life. All of a sudden, my health fell apart. <laughs> and it was because God had something to show me that it was very hard to teach a well man. Uh -huh. yeah, I'm telling you the truth now. Very hard to teach a person who's got time for everything so I'm going to do this for you, son. I'm going to take you out of circulation for a while so I can show you some things. Now, once I saw this, I had no trouble with it. If I hadn't have seen this, he would have been asking for prayer and all things. See, it's reasoning. One, if you can see things right, you'll think right. That's why Paul's teaching the way he is. You can see that, can't you? He's actually he's, he's, he's dispelling the fog that's been produced by the world. <laughs> he's dispelling the fog. And once in to participate, it's a high calling now they've been called to. As I, the prisoner of the Lord, I, I beseech you. As the mother version say, entreat or urge, beg. Make this request from my heart, exhort, so forth. The word beseech, if you want to look at it etymologically, means to address or speak to, to call, to call something that must be done in the way of exhortation, entreaty, comfort, instruction. I really didn't tell you a whole lot. The idea is to reach down and help them up. That's, that's the idea. It's like, remember that lame man at the gate, beautiful? Yeah. Peter came, he looked at him expecting to receive some alms, you know. Peter said, I don't have any money. So I knew right there he wasn't Pentecostal. <laughs> I'm sorry, you got to say that stuff once in a while today. <laughs> so I don't have any money, but what I have, I'm going to give to you. Take up your bed and walk. And it says he reached down. That's right. Took him by the hand. That gave him the courage to, to get up on his feet. That's what a beseech does. A beseech is leaning down and helping the person up. Let's look, let's look at this, because this is what I call a family word, beseech. This isn't a word that you address like the fornicators. Yeah. I beseech you, stop committing fornicate. This, yeah. <laughs> this is a, not the right word. Yeah. It's a family word. It assumes that the person you're talking to has got the heart for this. 
Maybe they don't know it. Maybe they're not in it as fully as they could be. But you know there's, there's something there to, to appeal to, beseech. It's not someone's going to draw back from it. And there's a lot of tenderness in beseech, gentleness in beseech. For instance, there are some things <coughs> that people just can't have. Even if it's a legitimate church, there's some things that can't, it just, just can't have them. It's got to make an investment to get them. Well, I'm going to give you an example. And this church wasn't beseeched. This is the church at Laodicea. He said, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich, and white garments you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eyes sad that you may see. That's Laodicea, the lukewarm church. So before we can get down to business here, before we can get down to business, <laughs> there's a purchase you got to make. Yeah. There's something you're going to have to give up to get it. Yeah. Doing as you make this purchase, and you can see and so forth, then we'll get on with business at hand. Yeah. Do you know that there's a lot of uh, churches in this state? I mean, you may pray they be get this and pray they get that. They aren't going to get it. Mm -hmm. They aren't going to get it. Mm -hmm. Paul didn't tell anybody, pray for the Laodicean brethren. Mm -hmm. Oh, no. He didn't say John didn't either. John didn't get this message of the churches and write out an epistle to all them. Be sure to pray for these, particularly five churches in Asia. They're really in bad shape. Pray for them. That God will... That's not how they recovered. These shows are going to be recovered by hearing a word from the Master Amen. on what they're to do. So what I'm pointing out here is the word beseech assumes they're not in this category. It assumes they're able to receive what's said. <coughs> See, not only the Ephesians, he already told them they were living by faith and love. They had faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and love to all saints. So they were, that's a describes a sensitive heart because to have faith toward God they have to have some sensitivity toward God and to love the brethren you have to have sensitivity to the brethren to some to some degree it may be a type that has to be increased but it's to some degree it's there that's what this beseech is based on not based on their achievement Amen. so to speak <coughs> so now they they must be motivated to extend themselves they're going to move them to extend themselves. Why is he doing this? Because salvation provides for this extending mm -hmm. and demands the extending. Mm -hmm. When for the reason of time you ought to be teachers, Paul didn't say, well, but I'll teach you anyway. I mean, no, there are some things. He's like, I've got a lot of things to say about Melchizedek, but not to you. Can't give it to you. Oh, there are so many advantages to growing in Christ and growing up into Christ and living holy for Him. There's so many advantages. This is one. You get to, you get to hear things that yeah. other people don't have the capacity to hear. Amen. Oh, Apostle, what are you going to tell these people now? Yes. I was this aspect you've already been talking about of the mind. And one who will not exercise his mind and fill it with the things of the Lord or stretch it won't, won't have this capacity. That's because right. Because of neglect, they would be weak-minded and That's feeble, right. not yeah. able to take a hold of the weightier matters that he would desire to do. That's right. <coughs> See, a true, a true servant of God will not depend on people doing this. Like I've heard people say, we got to teach people how to study. That's what the problem is. They don't know how to study. Well, they pass the driver's test, don't they? You got to read a book to do that, don't you? They passed fourth grade, didn't they? Had to read the book. So this is an improper assessment. No, you can't depend on people doing this. You have to inform them because, see, they're not, people are not in a vacuum. 
There's other influences. There's other people trying to tell them things beside you. There's other spirits that are trying to gain access to them beside Christ's Holy Spirit. And so you inform them of the thing. You awake, you, you don't wait till they finally wake up because they may never wake up. So here's what I'm, he says, I'm, I'm beseeching our brethren. I'm begging you to do this. I'm stooping as low as I can go. I'm getting, I'm getting down to where this is pretty plain. Walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. <coughs> Walk, as you know in the scriptures, referring to a manner of life that is a, your life is progressive like a walk from here to someplace else. You, life is the same way. It's a, it's a walk, so to speak. Walk worthy. Some people are afraid of the word worthy. None of us are worthy. Well, you better become worthy. Amen. We understand you're not worthy of, of salvation. We understand that, but there, that's not the only worthy there is. Other versions read this, walk in a manner worthy. So that, that in that way, how you walk has a certain gait, has a certain posture. You can walk looking over to the side, you know, <laughs> straight ahead. So there's a lot in the, the manner in which you walk. If you know where you're going, you don't, you don't just like slowly plod along. You walk in a manner worthy. Live a life that's worthy. New Revised Standard Version says, lead a life worthy. Basic Bible English says, see that your behavior is a credit. They're to God. People can conclude, oh, conclude, oh, that person got that from God. Live the kind of life which proves your profession, is the idea. Live and act in a way worthy. Live as though... I don't like this. And living as though you were worthy. That I guess that means pretend, but that's not right. Live and act as becomes or becoming to the, your profession. Live the way God, God's people should live. And here's the message Bible. I want you to get out there and walk. Better yet, run on the road God called you to travel. Well, that's a commentary. That's not a translation, but it, it presents a fair idea. The word worthy, what does that mean, worthy, worthy? Well, here it means like a becomingly, a appropriately, befittingly, suitably. So you profess to be a Christian in the parlance of the world, then your life should justify that profession, should exhibit you say, I'm living now, I love the Lord with all my heart. That's a standard staple saying, religious people. I love the Lord with all my heart, but I don't have time to meet with the saints. Your conduct can contradict your profession. But you don't understand all the things I got to do. No, you don't understand all the things God's got to do. That's the trouble. The trouble is we don't understand you. The trouble is you don't understand God. That's the trouble. Amen. <coughs> Worthy. There's a manner of life that precisely matches salvation. It coincides with what God intends to do. Amen. That such lives give glory to God or credit to Satan. One of the two is going to get credit for the way you live. Informed personalities, they're going to be able to make a precise diagnosis. That's of the wicked one, that's, that's of the holy one. People on earth, they, they won't be able to make an accurate appraisal. But now Remember, the purpose of salvation has been stated in a number of ways. Let's, let's rehearse them again. At least eight of them here. That we should be holy and without blame before him in love. All right, that's chapter 1, verse 4. That's an objective. Walking worthy now matches, has got to match that objective. In the 10th verse of the third, first chapter said that he might gather together into one all things in Christ. All right, so the life 
that matches that is a life that finds the person more and more identified with God, the people of God, the blessings of God. The more identity with that than with anything else. The third one, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace. It took a lot, it took a lot to get you where you're at. Now, a worthy walk matches that you've seen that. So you tap into this grace to bring glory to God. Fourth, there, there are good works to which we've been ordained. That's 2nd chapter, verse 10. They're not good works you cook up. They're good works to which you've been ordained. They've already been ordained. There's certain things God has intended that you do. I don't know what they are. I got my own work, work cut out identifying my own. But you, the, you, this is the truth. Yeah. So as you live, how do you say, how can I find this out? Present your body a living sacrifice to God, holy and acceptable, which is your reasonable service, that you might prove or find out what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So the way you find it out is you give yourself completely to God, spirit, soul, and body, and particularly your body. You refuse to let loan your body to the devil. You just, you're not going to do it. Amen. Then you'll find out Amen. what God has to you to for you to do, and then the important thing is to do it. Then there's a fifth to show his manifold wisdom to heavenly personalities through the church, chapter three, verse ten. So a walk worthy is a is a life you can say, hey, any principalities up there in the heavenly places? I call your attention to what I'm doing now. Yeah. We should be able to do this. Why not? That's what God intended. And when you know what you're doing, you can do it to your measure, I mean. Yes. Or better yet, have the Lord be able to say, have you considered That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Note. Take note, please. Everybody on this side, take note. <laughs> in the sixth, that Christ might dwell in your heart by faith. That's stated as an objective. That Christ might live permanently. See, it's one thing to receive Christ, John 1, 12, as many as received him, but now him stand, that's, that's another matter. Because he doesn't stay where he's not wanted. Like when he was ministering on earth, if some city didn't want him there, he, he didn't stay. That's right. See, so that's God's intention is for Christ to take up permanent residence in you, and salvation now is calculated to... Produce this. This isn't, this isn't like an impossible thing. Your life must complement that. Or seventh, that we may be rooted and grounded and might be able to comprehend. So if you say, I have a hard time understanding these things. Well, don't be discouraged. Don't be discouraged. If you can get rooted and grounded, <laughs> then you'll be able to comprehend. And if Christ dwells in your heart by faith, you will get rooted and grounded. I beseech you, I walk worthy of this type of vocation. So that Christ wouldn't have to say to somebody, say, now, I'd like to show you examples of my work, but don't, don't, don't look at them. You want them to be able to say, as Sister Brown said, have you considered? Mm -hmm. Here's someone that didn't bottleneck mm -hmm. my salvation. Here's someone didn't quench the spirit, didn't grieve the spirit. Here's someone didn't resist the spirit. Now I want you to notice, notice what happened in that person there. Walk worthy, see, of the calling. And then uh, finally that glory might be brought to him through the church collectively. So salvation is on an individual basis, but that's not the aim of it. That's not the aim. It's not for... God to save Joe, Frank, Mary, and Louise. That's, it's a body. Yes, amen. The body's the point. The individuals are incidental, but the body is the point. Oh, and that just doesn't mean the ones on living on earth now. That means all of them. So some of us say, boy, I remember I read Fox's Book of Martyrs. I read what people did in that day. All right, your life has got to blend in with that. Huh? You may not be threatened like they were threatened, but your life's got to be 
blend it in with that, walk worthy of your calling. See, the professed church, in my own judgment, has tolerated people who live in consistently too long. They shouldn't be tolerated. I just, it's a grievous thing to have to deal with any situation like this. I've only had to just very, very few times to praise God. I don't want to have to deal with this kind of situation to say to someone, you're not welcomed here anymore. You can't talk here anymore. I don't, I don't want to have to say that. But there are some people who do have to be told that. But to guard against that happening, that's what Paul's doing. Because he didn't like to do it either. He didn't find some kind of enjoyment <clears throat> by telling the Corinthians when you gather together, deliver that man over there over to Satan. This didn't bring delight to Paul. It doesn't bring delight to any sensitive soul. So he's beseeching him at this point so they don't, so that circumstance doesn't have to happen. Walk worthy now of the vocation. Vocation means calling. We call it an occupation. Say, what's your vocation? Mm -hmm. I'm an accountant. That's my vocation. I was an accountant for a while. That's my vocation. So if I walked worthy of an accountant, I at least would be able to add up correctly. When... <laughs> yeah, if you couldn't add up a set of three figures, I wouldn't be telling people I was an accountant. That's for sure. <laughs> but some people... Their lives don't add up, but they tell you they're a Christian, but their lives don't add up. Walk worthy of your vocation. What is this vocation, this calling? All right, here, here's some things that are stated about it. We are, Romans 1, 7, called to be saints. So well, that's a vocation, being saints, holy ones. We're called to be holy. Be holy. Here's, here's another one. Called into the fellowship of God's dear son, of his son. Mm -hmm. Or called according to his purpose. That's another one, Romans 8, 28. Or called into the grace of Christ, Galatians 1, 6. Mm -hmm. Or called into liberty, Galatians 5, 1. Or called into his kingdom and glory, 1 Thessalonians 2, 12. Or called unto holiness, 1 Thessalonians 4, 7. Or called unto eternal, that we might have received an eternal inheritance, Hebrews 5, 15. Or called to inherit a blessing, 1 Peter 3, 9. Or called unto his eternal glory, 5, 1 Peter 5, 10. See, those are vocations. And so you walk worthy, you walk so that, that, so that this intended, you've been called unto like there's a trip, uh, the road that leads from Joplin unto Springfield. Now to, ride, to drive worthily, you'd get on the road that... Yeah. <laughs> you wouldn't get on the road and head toward Tulsa. Right. I suppose someone might argue that you could eventually, you know, get to Springfield, but that is how some people are living. They're taking the roundabout course, imagining they'll be able to sustain life and find food and everything in this roundabout course. <laughs> Take a direct course. Walk in worthy is taking a direct course to what God's called you to. The vocation rule with ye are called. It is all God's people have been called to its common destiny. There are different ministries, I understand, but there's not different objectives. Yeah. One destiny that we're called to. The call came to it. How did the call come to you? Well, fortunately, the scriptures tell us, 2 Thessalonians 2.14, whereunto he called you by our gospel. Amen. Okay, so the call comes on the wings of the gospel it's like the dove that's how the call comes what if the gospel's not preached the call doesn't come oh you gotta see this wherever there's an erroneous gospel God isn't calling because he called you through the gospel that's how he called you and if you but see 
I will just speak for myself. In my younger days, when I was spent a lot of time around my younger associates, none of us really knew why God called us. Uh, finally, I finally worked up enough courage to ask my father. He knew. He told us what it was all about, and we knew we could. Well, we're a bit on the wrong path here. We've been, we've been headed the wrong way. And as soon as we saw that, I began to think of what I ought to be doing for the Lord. It was, it was a calling. Until that time, I didn't think much about that. Why? Because there was no calling to a to a corrupt gospel. There is no calling. The gospel produces a relentless search in those that believe it. Mm -hmm. They're glad to get out of sin. They're thankful to get out of sins. Their conscience purged. Now they're turning their attention to what wilt thou have me to do? Mm -hmm. And it, through the gospel, yeah. the call, mm -hmm. the call comes to you. Yeah. Haven't you found it to be so? As soon as you had a better grasp of what the gospel was, all of a sudden you looked at life differently. Mm -hmm. yeah. What was it? That was called you were, be, you were being called according to his purpose. Mm -hmm. Then, of course, along come with that. When you're called according to his purpose, God works all things together <laughs> for your good so you can fulfill your calling. I think I'll close there, but there's a... There's a lot in there, in there. Amen. I beseech you. Amen. Don't be uh, don't be ashamed to beg God's people to do what's right. Mm -hmm. Sometimes your tears will fill your eyes. You're, you're trying to move move them forward mm -hmm. as much as possible. Seek deliverance from a harsh spirit. Those, that type of attitude is toward the hard and calloused and that sort of thing, but not toward the tender. Yes, Sister Melissa? I was thinking that um, that's why it's so important not to have a weak gospel being preached. <laughs> yeah. uh, um, this beseeching is like an exhortation. It, it gives you confidence that's that right. you're able to walk worthy. Mm -hmm. uh, so many people are preaching now where people are telling people they're not able yeah. So, so yeah. this is this is preaching the gospel That's here. Right. When you hear this, then you you want to walk with you Amen. say, I can walk with you. Amen. Yeah. See, some of you, even the little, the young children, you hear them, they'll express desires to mm -hmm. that they have to do with pleasing God. What what caused that? There's some churches they could have attended, and they'd have never ask anything like that. Why not? The gospel is the vehicle That's through right. which the call comes, even if it's to young Samuel. Yes. Amen. See? So be encouraged. Uh, major on the gospel and where you face hard-hearted people, you got to get them in a position with rebuke and correction, instruction, get them in a position where they can hear. Yeah, that's right. But when you do, don't, don't go home. <laughs> when, when you've got them where they can hear, don't go home. Yeah. Deliver the, deliver the good news. And then with the good news will come the call to whatever, mm -hmm. whatever part of the body they're in. Mm -hmm. it's, the call comes through the gospel. Mm -hmm. yeah. Amen. Anyone else tonight have something you'd like to add? Amen. I like the strength of the word. One word you used in your last paragraph there. Summons. Mm -hmm. Summons. That's, yeah. that's I like serious. That too. That's weighty. I like that you too. Think of a summons. Mm -hmm. I like that too. Mm -hmm. Even in the world, you don't turn down a summons. You better not. That's right. <laughs> yeah. It's very encouraging to hear that those who were bought were precious, as precious as the blood that was shed to purchase. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's that gives you strength instantly. Amen. Mm -hmm. You can see why Paul talks so much about what God and Christ did. Yes, Brother Jeremy? Yeah, something else that really stood out to me is <clears throat> this idea that we have, you know, Lord Jesus has done everything. He has done salvation. But we have a work to do, too. Yes. Right. God has given his people a work to do. And we're to walk worthy of that and to get to work. Not, not just, We're not here just to have 
quote, fun. And the Lord is yeah. just making everything easy for us. Through hardship, things are, right. the Lord does a great work. That's right. Yeah, Paul says, I got the greater work, I got the greater hardship, and I kept doing the work anyway. Amen. Yes. And Christ has accomplished salvation. Yes. But now it said that he's going to get glory in the church. Yes. What we see when people are walking worthy of their vocation mm -hmm. is Christ operating yeah. in them. Yeah. Amen. Amen. So Amen. it's still of God, but Amen. this this the fact that we're doing it shows the identity that we have. <laughs> we're not, we haven't yeah. remained separate from him. Mm -hmm. We've been grafted in. Mm -hmm. yeah. it, it shows yes. the nature of the unity that we have. So that's why Paul could say it is no longer uh, it, you know that that what he was before was no longer him. That he had a new identity, and what you were seeing in him then was Christ Amen. in him. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Amen. <coughs> yes, it's Sasha. Yeah, I was considering. I appreciated the point that you made about um, our sin being forgiven is not the end of the matter. It's yeah. only it's only in preparation yeah. for us to be able uh -huh. to yeah. hear. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm call the Lord and to recognize the vocation that he's called us to and I'm reminded of Isaiah in the temple Yes. when when the angel placed the coal on his lips it took away yeah. it cleared the way for yeah. him to be able to hear the voice of the Lord and whenever God had called who, will, who shall I send Isaiah was quick to say send me yeah. and that that's how the gospel works mm -hmm. in our in the day of salvation that we live in when we when we hear the sound of the good news then we hear the calling of the Lord and we're able to say send me Amen. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. Brother Given you mentioned and labor just quite effectively that until a person thinks right, yeah. yeah. They're not they're not gonna do what's that's right. right. And yeah. then, initially I think we've all to some degree any serious person that's seen something clear and tried to explain it to somebody who hasn't seen it. Oh, yeah. Can experience what Paul's trying oh, to do. Yeah. Uh -huh. Trying to get them to see something that, from their perspective, it's impossible because yeah. they don't think right. Yeah. Yes. And yet, yeah. you know, if, if if you just present what's been <coughs> given, if you if you can be have the wisdom to be able to sense where they're at, yeah. then you can lead them out of the darkness yeah, that they're amen. at. Amen. But the, but that that's an experience that has to be experienced. You can't really relate that's it as right. well. See, the first three chapters, Paul was baiting the hook. That's right. <laughs> now, now he threw the hook in the water in chapter 4. Yeah, but if you take away the first three chapters and read chapter 4, 1, you say, whoa, how, how, how are we going to do that? Yeah. All right, we'll have a word of prayer. 